Tucker's Monster is a book I started writing 40 years ago, but my career took a turn and I ended up a screenwriter in Hollywood. All these years later, I literally dusted off the old typewritten manuscript and began again. That turned out to be a fascinating process. I had not looked at these pages in over 35 years. It was like reading somebody else's writing. The biggest challenge was getting back into a novel writing style as opposed to a screenplay writing style. A screenplay is all about efficiency. It's a blueprint for a movie, and a hundred plus people come together to flesh that blueprint out. In a novel, of course, it's my responsibility to paint that image in the reader's mind. We entered Tucker's library. It was as rough and cavernous as the hallway. Huge leather chairs, so large that they could hardly be moved by one person. Hulking bookcases of solid teak, a towering stone fireplace that would have been the envy of an English king. It made me feel small, as though I had wandered into the domain of some brooding giant. And yet Tucker would say later, wouldn't want the place to blow away in a good wind. Most of my writings have incorporated fantastical or science fiction elements, short circuit, batteries not included, heart and soul, all the Tremors movies, and Tucker's Monster's no different. My dad was the kind of guy who would take a five-year-old to a movie called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. I knew only as the monster that ate the roller coaster. And I loved that kind of stuff, but I never got over it. I've always had a fascination for big machines. I live in a rural community where we maintain our own dirt roads, and I've inherited the local road grader, which I've learned to operate. Tremors 4 has a steam traction engine in the climax. Even Tucker's Monster incorporates similar themes. Tucker's Monster is an adventure story. It starts in 1903, when a young zoologist, Gerard Whitney, is hired by an Oklahoma cattle rancher named Harold Tucker. The eccentric rancher and his exotic Cherokee wife travel the world looking for legendary creatures. As Tucker himself tells Whitney, here's the deal, I'm looking for a dinosaur, been looking for one coming up on 25 years. Don't interrupt, I have to tell this story a lot and it bores the warts off me. Tucker is an over-the-top character. His expeditionary wagon is a massive freight wagon. His guns are the biggest guns you can buy. Very quickly, Whitney finds himself tracking a supposed werewolf in Louisiana, exploring a haunted house in Vermont, facing down a mad scientist in Venezuela, and ultimately come across something that exceeds all their wildest dreams. A faint orange glow began to fill the room. The light came from oil lamp wall sconces whose flames were being turned up as though by invisible hands. I could see that even Tucker was impressed. As the lantern light grew brighter, my gaze swept round the room. It was huge, perhaps at one time a ballroom. The walls were of lustrously lacquered maple. The ceiling was a magnificent white dome in which hung an enormous scintillating brass chandelier with dozens of polished reflectors. Tucker scowled, looked nervously around the room. Don't like being led by the nose, he whispered. It was unearthly quiet. Each step we took seemed as loud as hooves on a wooden bridge. But then, a curious tinkling came to my ears, like tiny Christmas bells. Then I felt a soft patter on my hat, like sand dropping from above. Tucker suddenly hissed in alarm. Oh, bless it! With swiftness that belied his stocky frame, he leapt toward me and grabbed the back of my overcoat, yanking me bodily backward. But the immense chandelier suddenly tore free from its ancient mounting and crashed down exactly where I had stood. Tucker cursed himself, forgot all about that. Jenny rushed over, whispering, I didn't think of it either. Whitney, are you all right? Y yes, I stammered, but then asked, utterly confused, think of what? Tucker pointed his lamat at the crumpled remains of the chandelier. Gotta watch them things. They make a regular habit of trying to fall on folks. Shaken as I was, I was determined to argue the point that every haunted house couldn't have a chandelier that just happened to fall on you when you walked under it. But that's when the lanterns begin to go out. I do think that fantasy works best if it is surrounded by reality. 
By that I mean if you have one fantastical element in a story, everything else in that story, the characters and the setting, should feel very real and normal. 